At a distance of about 150 light years lies a ticking time bomb we know as the star system IK Pegasi. The system that ranks among the few star systems that can directly affect Earth if and when it goes supernova. This is the nearest known supernova candidate star and is a member of a binary system. It's an A-type main sequence star with a white dwarf companion. In the future, it's somewhat uncertain just when, the main star will exhaust the hydrogen fuel in its core and swell into a red giant phase, an eventuality that will see the star gain up to a hundred times its current radius. Once that happens, a very strange and potentially dangerous chain of events will begin. The first step will be an exchange of material between the two members of the system, in that the white dwarf will begin to accrete material from the bloated red giant star. This is a recipe for disaster. As the white dwarf gathers that material, two things will happen. First the star's orbit will shrink, and then that hydrogen and helium from the red giant will begin to compress and become increasingly hot on the surface of the white dwarf. Eventually the white dwarf, which is normally seen as a dead, cooling remnant of a star, comes back to life as a kind of zombie or vampire star feeding off its main host. The pressure and heat will eventually become so great that fusion occurs once more at the white dwarf, and a recurrent nova cycle results. This is known as a cataclysmic variable star, where wild and very pronounced changes occur in its luminosity as the novas periodically spark off. There are known examples of this in the galaxy, thankfully none as close as IK Pegasi, but there's a possibility that it won't simply end at recurrent novas but that overall, the white dwarf will continue to gain mass, despite what gets blown off during the nova periods. An alternative model suggests that a sustained fusion burn could occur instead, but regardless if the white dwarf's mass continues to grow, it will approach something known as the Chandra Sekhar limit. After a revision by Dr. Subramanian Chandra Sekhar in 1930 of a previous set of calculations. This limit, which is currently thought to be about 1.4 solar masses, is the largest mass a stable white dwarf can achieve without a cataclysmic collapse occurring. This is because of electron degeneracy pressure and gravity. In a dense white dwarf, electrons are forced into higher energy states, they start moving faster, and that creates electron degeneracy pressure, which in turn supports the white dwarf from undergoing further gravitational collapse. But when you hit the Chandra Sekhar limit, the electrons are moving near the speed of light, and that pressure is overcome. And this is where things get uncertain depending on what the white dwarf's core is composed of. During the collapse, if it's mostly oxygen, magnesium, and neon, it should form a neutron star with relatively little of the star's mass ejected. But if it's carbon and oxygen, runaway carbon fusion will occur before it hits the Chandra Sekhar limit, and boom. This is known as a Type 1a supernova, and given the proximity of the IK Pegasi system, this could pose a threat to life on Earth. When will this mess of uncertainty unfold? It's not likely for a very long time, though no one is certain when exactly it will happen. What is certain is that the star system is moving away from us, so the risk lessens with time. But by the time it does eventually go supernova, if indeed it goes that route, it may still be close enough to have an effect on Earth, but not to cause a major mass extinction. It's simply not close enough under current thinking to be able to do it. But there are also averages, and on average, a supernova will occur near Earth within about 33 light years that can cause mass extinction about every 240 million years. How they do it is gamma rays and their effect on the Earth's atmosphere. The effect is that the gamma rays cause molecular nitrogen and oxygen to react to become nitrogen oxides, which depletes the ozone layer, which in turn allows the sun's ultraviolet light and other dangerous radiation to reach the surface and start the chain that leads to mass extinction. And indeed a supernova is a main candidate for the end or division mass extinction in Earth's past. Deplete the phytoplankton and the reefs, and that takes out the base of the marine food chain. Type 1a supernovae aren't the only threat, so are Type 2, which a number of prominent night sky stars are predicted to eventually produce, such as Betelgeuse, but none are close enough to pose a threat. 
Though in the future, as the sun makes its way through the galaxy, it could run into giant stars that do. This has happened. It's thought that as many as 20 supernovae have occurred near Earth in the last 11 million years. For example, a type 2 supernova happening within about 26 light years would burn off half the Earth's ozone layer very rapidly. This has been observed. Supernova 1987A in the Large Magellanic Cloud kicked off radiation of this magnitude. But the Type 1A supernovae are the worst because they involve dim white dwarfs, which are something we are not fully aware of as far as populations nearby Earth go. There may be worse ones out there than IK Pegasi, but within all of this there is a mystery. With so many supernovae going on in the past, why didn't they cause very obvious periods of extinction? Sediment studies to look for isotope signatures of supernovae in Earth's ocean show they happen, particularly with Iron 60. The scientists studying that found comparatively a lot of it. That means that either the supernova that caused that was recent, within the last 5 million years, or it was extremely close. If it were close, then why wasn't there a mass extinction? And the mystery deepens with the supernova remnant RX K0852.0-4622, which had to be a recent supernova due to its chemical signatures, as in about 800 years ago, and should have been prominently visible in the night sky for a time. But no humans keeping records on such things in those days, and there were quite a few, seem to have seen it. Even weirder, it's a statistical outlier in that you should only see one that close every 100,000 years, yet it appears to have happened without anyone seeing it. And it's not just the ocean. Further work in Antarctica has shown once again iron isotopes associated with supernovae. It's been argued that the probability of supernovae happening nearby Earth is actually rising due to Earth entering the Orion arm of the Milky Way. There are many mysteries involving supernovae in our galaxy, but it doesn't end there. There are two other odd supernova-related phenomena that may very directly affect the chance for life in the universe. The first is the formation of the solar system itself. It's unclear how the dust and gas that made up the material for the solar system started collapsing and lumping together to form what eventually would be the planets. It has been suggested that the concussion from a nearby supernova at the dawn of the solar system could have been this trigger mechanism. No nearby supernova, no Earth. On the other hand, that probably isn't that rare of an occurrence. We see planetary systems everywhere, and supernovae happen regularly around the galaxy on geologic timescales, and indeed were once more common. We also see evidence for near-Earth supernovae in meteorites. They exhibit isotopes that show between 1 to 5 million years before they fully formed, there was a nearby supernova. In addition to this, a great deal of the material that comprises the solar system originated in supernovae over a period of billions of years. There's also the question of how our solar system was populated with heavy metals during its formation. This may have been due to a succession of supernovae based on studies of star-forming regions. This particularly has to do with the presence of the isotope aluminum-26. This isotope is formed in stars and is expelled during supernovae, but also to some degree in the winds of wolf Rayae stars. But there appears to be more of this element around during the formation of the solar system than a single supernova could account for, and wolf Rayae stars are less likely. But within this, there is another mystery. For multiple supernovae to have delivered aluminum-26 to account for the observation in meteorites, all of that aluminum from different sources in different times would have had to be heated by some unknown event early in the solar system to reset things so that all of the aluminum appears to have formed at the same time, as far as radiogenic dating goes. So what happened here? No one knows, but whatever this heating event was, it would have had to vaporize all the material in the solar system for a time that may invoke yet another nearby supernova but that would require the supernova being close enough to heat everything up, but far enough not to destroy everything. That's asking a lot, but it's also been suggested that the very young sun might have gone through some sort of outburst, which has been observed in protostars elsewhere in the galaxy, but they don't appear to be powerful enough for a full-scale reheat of the solar system's materials. It's also possible that there's something about aluminum-26 generation that we simply don't know. 
so the whole thing is up for revision as more discoveries are made. And there's a huge problem here. Some meteorites also exhibit interstellar grains, material that was picked up that predates the solar system and originated in other star systems. If there was a giant heating event from the protosun having an outburst, or a nearby supernova, these would have been melted. And there's also a question surrounding the abundance of heavy water in the solar system. This should not be if there was a heating event. So barring that, where did all the aluminum-26 come from? And finally, there is the question of life. Firstly, most of the elements used by life were forged in supernovae. No supernovae, no heavier elements essential for life. But it may also be the case that supernova activity in the universe directly contributes to habitability. This is through the production of cosmic rays that interact with Earth's atmosphere. It's thought that this might create a chain of events in the atmosphere that ultimately leads to a cooler climate, more conducive to life and also plays into nutrient generation and distribution. So all of this creates a question. If supernovae are essential for life, but too many of them are bad for life, and too few are also bad for life, then is it possible that the solution of the Fermi Paradox is that the right balance of supernovae are required for a galaxy's habitability, from planet formation to abiogenesis itself, to moderating the atmospheres of inhabited exoplanets? That's probably not that rare of a situation, but it would make suitable galaxies a bit scarce. The question of would we even be here if there hadn't been enough supernovae aside, I leave you with this. What we do know is that this galaxy is habitable. So this one does not solve the Fermi Paradox, but highlights it. If we're here, then there should be many others in the habitable zone of the Milky Way. Where are they? Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently wondering if a common first contact message in the universe is instructions for supernova mitigation as a public service. Or worse, selling supernova be gone, anti supernova, and general lubricant spray. And then you find out it doesn't work as advertised. Very questionable on the part of the aliens. And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live. <laughs>